Good morning. I'm your host, Carol Dean, and I'm present from the Heart Productions. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We've been operating for 30 years, and our job is to educate and inform filmmakers. And we love working with filmmakers on a daily basis. So we created these Everything You Want to Know classes to educate you in this ever-changing industry. And uh, we're very excited today because we have a chance to learn about film festivals. I go to them often, but I really need to know how can you make the most out of a festival? And that's what we're going to learn today. And how do you network? I mean, I'm honestly, even though I love teaching, I'm very shy. So how do you meet people? And we're going to learn all this from Annabelle. We have four grants a year. And our short film grant is closing, uh, uh, what is it close? April 29th. So we invite you to join us there. Our website's full of funding information. You would go to the resource tab and the blog tab, and you'll learn a lot about people in our industry, about documentary and feature filmmakers and what they did and how they made their films. So I really encourage you to take advantage of that. And uh, our moderator and internet technology person is Nahid Ishmael. And Nahid is in Kenya, and he takes people on safari as well. So I'll turn it over to you, Nahid. Thank you, Carol. And thank you, everyone, for joining our class today. The outline for our class is Carol Dean will interview Annabelle Munro, director of the Ethos Film Awards. We have everyone muted, and we encourage questions. As you have questions, please put them in the chat bar and I will ask for you. After the questions, we will have some fun and awards for film buffs. Carol created film questions about classic films you love. The first one to put the answer in the chat bar is the winner. You can win Carol Dean's three hour class on how to fund your film that covers five ways to fund your film and covers pitching and closing your donors and investors. This class is for you to take advantage of Annabelle's festival knowledge and learn all you can. That is our outline. And now I want you to introduce you to Annabelle Munro. Annabelle Munro, who is a multi-talented actor, producer, director, and entrepreneur with a passion for independent filmmaking. Born and raised in Germany, she started her production company Blue Boots Entertainment LLC in 2011 in Los Angeles, California. In addition to her work on a variety of film and television projects, she's also the founder and director of the Santa Monica based purpose driven 501c3 film festival, the Ethos Film Awards, dedicated to supporting and celebrating independent and underrepresented filmmakers from around the world. Welcome, Annabelle. Yes, thank you, Annabelle. So we want to learn everything we can today about film festivals. So let's start with your festival, the Ethos Film Awards International Film Festival. So what do you look for in an application? Hi, everybody. So excited to be here. What I personally look for in um, an application or submission with our specific purpose-driven theme is the message of the film. Uh, because most of the time, filmmakers, they start out because they want to change the world and then they learn pretty early, oh no, now I have to make a horror movie <laughs> to have a genre-driven film to get the market. Um, so what we want to attract is filmmakers who haven't forgotten the sacred art of storytelling and understand to make a movie that still has a meaningful message that can travel the world and reach a large audience. But obviously that is quite the difficult task. We understand that. So we unite around the cause, you know, the message that that's what we are looking for passion, for the message. And it doesn't mean preaching to the choir. That means understanding that you can reduce the message to the essence, which is most of the time more effective because people want to be entertained, not preached to. And 
people understand that they usually win <laughs> in our festival. Wonderful. No, I understand. What's the story? That's what we want to know when you apply for grants. Tell me right. the story. So what type of films can apply to your festival? Any films. So we take um, documentary, short, long, but also fiction. And I noticed that because we are purpose driven that people automatically assume it's documentary, but it's not. So we are very excited when we're actually getting a genre fiction film, like a horror, you can make a, a, an amazing horror film if you have the intention to, to promote a very important message and not just splatter and gore and horror because life can be quite horrible at times. And you know, what do you do with this? These are the movies we really, really love to receive, but it's pretty much any genre. We also look at score. Um, we look at scripts, of course, short, long. We do PSAs. This year we have a very exciting free competition where we collaborated with Kay Sumner from CBS and the Santa Monica College. And that's focused on the dangers of drugs. And Kay Sumner, the amazing producer, was brilliant. She said, let's ask students to make those um, PSAs because they are the most affected audience. So you create in the language you understand, and then we can send it you know, on TikTok, on all the social media to hopefully go viral and spread the message yeah okay. proof of concepts we accept as well television pilots um, either filmed or written anything and quite honestly if you sitting here and think we don't have a certain um, format that that we don't pref um, represent just write to us because we can create it it's literally to help the filmmakers not to be rigid in the approach we are very flexible that's good to know. All right. Well, when applying, tell us the things that people forget or should pay more attention to. Oh, yeah. So I noticed that a lot of people that submit have an incomplete profile. So we, most of the film, festival, film festivals, as you may know, use Film Freeway. And so you have all these different pages to fill out, a director's statement, a picture of the director. I want to know who I'm talking to. I, I, that's just me. A poster. How many movies that are excellent don't have a poster? I don't get it. It's such a vital marketing tool. Um, stills from behind the scenes. It gives me as a director and the judges within seconds an idea how professional the person is that um, applies, how serious about their film and also the quality. So if you put time in filling out the profile for your film, including banner, it, like literally every function that you find, fill it out, take your time, don't do a, you know, a rush job because you give me you know, a visual presentation. It's similar to shopping your movie around with a deck. That's what you're doing with, with shopping your movie around on Film Freeway. So that would be my biggest tip. And then there's another one, people don't take enough advantage of contacting the director. Many do, but they ask for a freebie, but not many uh, people just reach out to introduce themselves. And the ones who are not asking for a handout that just can create the connection with the director. These are the ones that stand out in the festival as well, because they understand the importance of the human connections, right? Like directors are humans. They want to be treated not like a cash machine or the freebie machine. They want to create that connection vice versa with you, the filmmaker. And if it starts with respect, what a great start. Absolutely. Uh, you know, in my class, I teach with Tom Malloy. The first class, we talk about your poster. And Tom recommends 99 Designs are uh, Fiverr. But he, even though he is brilliant at designs, he pays to have someone do the designs. It's a small amount of money and you can get very good posters for $100. So that's important. Plus your business cards. Don't get the free business cards. Pay for them, all right? Because they're very important. When people get home, Tom puts his picture on the business card. I think that's important. 
Okay, and Nahid, do you have any questions for us? Yes, uh, we do have uh, questions. Uh, Clara West is asking, what about animated uh, shorts? Absolutely, 100%. If it has a story, if it's filmed or script or even only audible, we want to hear about it because it's about the storytelling. So animated, love animation, love, love, love it. Okay. And then Marianne uh, Williams is asking, uh, maybe also if you need clarification, we can have a uh, speak. She's asking, could you clarify if the stills section on Film Freeway is for BTS shots or for film stills or a bit of both? You know, um, if you feel that you're behind the scenes, because we do have a still photography section for submissions, because sometimes if we receive story being told in a picture, right? We just talked about the importance of a poster to carry the message of the whole film. So if we sub uh, receive an amazing submission, we have um, put an exhibit together, right? And showcase that art because the visual element is so vital for film if it's composition or the poster art or a deck. So we, we think all these connected art forms are relevant. So. If your BTS footage um, is so amazing, in, in your own opinion, yeah. to submit it, you know, you might convince me that this would be worth um, exhibiting if it tells a story. So I, I love the thought. And otherwise, um, I, I think for clarification, if you refer to filling out your page as a filmmaker, put the best behind the scenes um, pictures on your profile that really showcase, um, don't, don't put grainy sloppy stuff up there, but, uh, but pictures that encapsulate the progress you had on set best, right? That also show a certain quality. Doesn't mean they have to look cinematic, but show me the team, show me the environment, show me the mood that you had on set that you were proud of. This is really important. Uh, I, uh, I really ag agree. I think you've got, and I think filmmakers should promote themselves. When I read bios, I want you to, I want to see a picture and I want to know all about you and don't be, you know, don't be shy. Put everything on that page. If you want awards for anything, I don't care how long ago, talk about it because uh, we need to know who you are to make major decisions about your film. And you need to make, let us know that you're there for the long term and that you're in this film festival, but you're there to find other distribution areas. You're off to take care of your audience. You're finding your audience at your festival, right? So uh, let's get into purpose driven and why is the Ethos Film Festival different? Mm, my favorite question. So when I started the festival, I noticed um, that most of the time we, we have awards vanity in film, right? The best, the best looking actress, or I don't know. It's, um, it, it was just so interesting for me to see that, for example, if you look at the Perlitzer Prize, People always look at the theme and I personally perceive film as such a powerful tool. That's why I became a filmmaker and actor and a storyteller, because I personally believe it's more powerful than politics, because you don't preach uh, or manipulate people. You tell them a story full with emotions and mistakes people make and solutions and the audience can make their own choice and feel right, and maybe be warned or have a vision presented to them that they can come on board with without being forced to do that as we entertain. I think it's such a beautiful tool. And that's why I thought, hey, let's just look solely at the message. And of course, there's going to be the question, low budget versus big budget. But we take all of that in account because a uh, low, low, low budget that has a organic growth to it can totally compete um, with a big budget that has sold out a little bit too much. So we understand. We mainly look really at the passion for the cause. And it's also such a beautiful bridge between successful filmmakers and emerging filmmakers 
that can meet at the festival that are screened in the same block uh, according to the same theme and they connect over that from the heart suddenly you have the competition removed suddenly you have the success levels removed as a barrier where the one is the please help me and the other one oh i'm the big mentor no because people have the same heartaches over these causes for example we had a, a block last year where we had um, it was about drug addiction again, and there was a very famous producer who had su submitted his film together with newbies, and it turns out all of them had lost people, right, through drug addiction, and that really created a energy and an urgency in the room to transcend all these superficial boundaries between us as humans wanting to make the world a better place. So it's so exciting. And um, the passion, by the way, is the number one ingredient to success. If you are passionate about the cause, your message, and your heart that you're putting in, it doesn't matter how much money you spend on it, because all of that will come. It is the energy to get stuff done and to get visibility. It's unstoppable. Great. Put some passion on the page. That's what I say. I love it when you pick something up and it just, or nowadays you read something, but it jumps off the screen and says, this I am making and I know what I'm doing and I want you to join me. That's what we want to see and hear, right? So, uh, Nahid, let's have some more questions. Absolutely. Okay, there's a good one from uh, Gwendolyn Black. Um, she says, I've been an art curator and event producer for many years, and I recently ventured into filmmaking. I have a trailer ready. I'm calling it a trailer, and I'm planning to add to it. Do you have any suggestions? Should I try submitting it to festivals at this point? Am I ready? I haven't seen it, but your question lets me figure that you might be ready, and the uh, what I would recommend is to look into proof of concept because you could, uh, but I haven't seen it. If it could work as a proof of concept, there's quite the market out there. And it's very, very helpful to have a good trailer to get your story to the next step because it's a visual industry. People want to see in a very short amount of time what your story is about. So trailers are powerful. And that you are an art um, and event professional lets me assume that you are a professional person and you would not submit something that visually isn't stunning. So I encourage you to look into proof of concept um, submissions or even trailers. There's also trailer competitions. Okay. Uh, and then Nina is asking, are the submitted films always viewed through to the end and by who? How does the viewing and selection process work, please? Yeah, they are not all because when we do pre-selections, that means we select potential films, I can see in a very short amount of time, and it's not just me, the whole team, if something isn't up to par, right? So, you know, in screenwriting, for example, there's, there's rules. Let's use screenwriting because it's much easier than film. If the script is riddled with grammar mistakes, if I am already bored out of my mind in the first 10 pages and it's rambling and somebody just has no idea about storytelling, I will not have to read the whole script. I'm telling you because that person is not ready. And the same account is for film. You know, if somebody shoots, uh, sends me uh, a, a movie that is, I, I don't even know because it can be all sorts of stuff that looks immediately extremely unprofessional or even if it's unprofessional, it's extremely offensive. I had a famous comedian submit something. It was a suicide PSA, but it was making fun of people committing suicide. And I thought, wow, I have to like, okay, this is, I'm sure I looked up who that person is because I couldn't believe I found it so offensive. I didn't watch the whole thing and it was a no selection and I would not ask any of my judges to confirm my opinion, but we all go through it, the whole team. And as we read through, you know, immediately the, the ones that are at a certain professional level 
And that doesn't mean the budget, it means the understanding of the craft of storytelling. You recognize them very, very shortly. And once you are selected, then every movie is watched. Okay. And every script, and then, uh, script is uh, read as well. Okay. Uh, Devin is asking uh, another question. I hear a lot about short film length and that filmmakers need to be really careful about the length of the short in order to make it more programmable for the festivals. If you have a short film that is landing in the 18, 22 minute range, do you recommend trying to cut it down to 16 to 18 minutes if possible, or is there a target length that is best? Absolutely, always the, the, the shorter, the better, because film directors, you know, you, you're competing against so many movies and it's not movies, it's precious, precious filmmakers, right? So you wanna give as many filmmakers as possible a chance to be programmed. And so if somebody understands that uh, 22 minutes, that's a third of an hour, Right, so you have to think that way, how much space you're taking. And also a story that takes 22 minutes, you can tell usually in a shorter amount too. Less is more, especially for short uh, film format. When it's 30 minutes, you know, I don't know, why didn't you make the fe feature film? You're like, you have already done so much and you know it's not a, a, a good format for film festivals unless you have whatever the ex there's always exceptions where you have this one in a million themes and the actor and you know it's a story of your life and all of that but if it's to get seen and the story is not the stories of all time that really only can be told in 30 minutes keep it as short as possible because it ups your chances so much to find a slot in the program because we look after time. So it's two hour blocks, sometimes one hour and 45 minutes because there's a cleaning cycle. And it's hard because there's also feature films you're competing against, right? So you rather wanna be in a short film block and if yours is 22 and the majority is shorter, your movie looks like the main film. So you carry that responsibility that it has to be the best to get that slot. The shorter, the better, always, if you can. Great. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, Constance is asking, when promoting a film, besides the director, who else should attend the film festivals? The passionate ones, the passionate ones. And that doesn't mean the loopy ones who want to be famous, but the ones who are really, really, really involved with the film, who are not afraid to market the thing, to, to get the eyeballs and invite people in a pleasant way, you know, where it's not me, 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 but it's like, you really have to see this film. This is about this and that. Yeah, whoever is the passionate forefront of the film should, should come. And the more the better, because directors also look at, you know, if you're bringing your gang, because if you're only alone the whole time, it, it yeah, it, it shows a lack of passion to get that wave going such a better energy if you bring a team. You know, I wanted to ask you about um, finding your audience because uh, Leah Warshawski went to a lot of film festivals and I asked her, why so many? And she said, Carol, I found as she was doing a documentary about her grandmother and how she had come from Auschwitz and how they were, they closed the entire uh, uh, area uh, where they had all the shops, shopping mall. And she refused to leave. She had a shop that did tailoring and she refused to leave. So uh, it was a great story about tenacity. And she found through film festivals, lots of new markets that she would never have found before because she worked with her audience, talked to her audience afterwards to find out what they thought of the film. And she found it was great for prisoners in prison because of her tenacity and her demand, demanding her future. And she created it. Uh, hospitals, people that were sick enjoyed it. So do you see that happening? And how how can you use the festival to find your audience? 
I have a favorite example. So there was this wonderful movie, Barbie Joe, um, about a lady who, and again about drug addiction. I don't know why everything's to say is about addiction. Um, who recovered and became this very important person in the recovery community. And because of the passion, right, where all the humble schmumble, oh, I don't want to put myself in the forefront. No, people who are carried by the passion, they know I'm not that important. It is about promoting the message and getting people aware of the cause. So that creates such a firestorm under their wings. So what these filmmakers did, they connected before they went to the festival with the local recovery places and then the communities where this lady was already known to bring them to watch the film. So it develops this own dynamic. And then those people bring people that they know. And that's, you know, that's how you grow your audience and find out new, new people. And so for the festivals, if you are um, accepted in the large festivals, you have your inbuilt audience, right? Because people will always, um, there, there will always be a sold out show because it's the festival that attracts. But if you're in a mid-sized festival, the more you get active to get your own audience organized, the better, because it will create attention that there is somebody serious about what they are doing in the festival and the directors and the team take notice it's amazing and if you don't use the tool to think about that yourself who you can bring without becoming a ticket merchant it's not that please buy a ticket i see that so often where people just go over the monetary thing no it's about um you gotta go all the way up and remember why you made the film and then find people who connect with the film and they buy a ticket gladly and you have a much better ch uh, chance to succeed in a mid-size to small festival because if you're doing it the professional way versus oh, i don't know what i'm doing you can come back every year right and you actually add to the festival and the festival sees that and rewards it because they are also they're in the same boat with you you know, a mid-sized festival doesn't make the million dollar profit at all. They are fighting hard for the good cause to make it happen and don't have salaries oftentimes. So it's a, it's a working together situation. Right. Okay, Nahid, any more questions? Yes, we have um, a few questions regarding your festival in Santa Monica. When is your 2024 festival? November. It's November oh. 10 to the 17th. The dates might change a tiny little bit. And also we have a one month online version because screening space is so tight if you get a lot of submissions. Um, and obviously I believe firmly in a live event. There's nothing compares like online is a, is a different animal. I firmly believe in people meeting in real life. However, there are so many good movies that still benefit from being screened within the context so they can get their laurel, they can get an audience choice award and get a platform. If somebody lives in Africa or in Japan, they can't come. So we have an online section that is a, a month um, long. So if someone, if someone submits a film, um, let's say if I submit my film to a few 2023 festivals, does that then make me el ineligible to submit for 2024 festival? Or no. am I still? No, okay. no. We are very easy going because it's about helping the filmmakers not being rigid for no reason. And no reason to, to shut a door in somebody's face. Makes no sense. If you have a good movie, if it makes sense to the filmmaker to come twice or whatever, it makes sense to us. Actually, it's great. Why not, you know? You got to be really confident and and follow your own what is it your own whistle your own flute your own <laughs> instinct <laughs> right. is You're it uh, helpful for for people to look at previous festival winners to see their stories or aesthetic style your festivals likes yes um in our particular festival yes and no because we are so open, Qu quality transcends uh, a certain style, 
it's it's random actually because it's totally dependent on the submissions i rather have instead of you like getting too hung about hung up about the website to just really really focus on your own best because your own best might look completely different and add a whole new category to the festival we change the titles of the awards every year dependent on submissions and there's new ones popping up where we're like wow this is amazing for families or whatever so we quick we create special awards if we see wow somebody chose that topic that is that wasn't even there before but it's that's so outstanding let's give them honor let's give them the glory and platform okay. so follow your own quality and passion again it's i'm saying the same thing <laughs> okay. good uh, let me give one question uh, uh, to annabelle and then carol i'll turn it back to you so uh eve stanton is asking we have finished a feature film all on our own money and power however the cinematographer and writer come from a background working with large studios from decades ago. So our film looks maybe bigger than it is because of the people involved, but it is really is a micro budget indie film. Wonderful. Would this type of situation uh, be problematic for submitting to your, your festival or any other festival? Not at all, not at all. Um, at Ethos Film Awards, uh, myself, I don't usually don't like to start with myself, but since I'm the founder, I'm a filmmaker, right? I'm in the same boat. I make movies still. I understand the process. And if somebody pulls off a, a, a high dollar, high production value production with a minimum uh, budget, wow, fantastic. So I, it would never count against you. Never, ever, ever. I think it's great. Congratulations. Yeah, uh, it would be weird if somebody would be turned off by by that. It's great. Shows me you're very skilled that you pulled it off. Well, okay. Uh, tell us, is there a list of film festivals and where c can we find that so we know what's available? So the platform number one in the world is Film Freeway. The way to find your list is what kind of film do you have and where would you realistically want to go, right? I would always look at locations and then browse through what's possible and start with where you live or what's close by and doable and then have a few outliers where you think, wow, uh, California, Los Angeles would be cool because the, there's high chances that there will be the real deal industry professionals present. So that's how I would get my list together. And of course, there's like, if you look in, 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 on platforms, there's suggested lists, but to me, they have always been meaningless because of course there's the top like um, Palm Springs and this and that but what does it mean to me if my movie is not a fit and I don't know anybody because this, these are big festivals you need to have a connection to the programmer that's my experience I, I don't know if that's politically correct but it's my experience that when I had a buddy oh I knew the program director and boom their movie is there and I'm thinking oh, I don't know that movie is not that good <laughs> but <laughs> So it's a little bit political there. So yeah, follow what makes sense for you. What's within your budget? Can you go there? And if you want to spend a little extra money, make sure it's in an industry um, city where chances are high that they have important people come. And who is the director? Because if the director is not available to you and you have a, that feeling, I don't know if that's going to be successful. You need to have a little bit of warm and fuzzy feeling that somebody will pay attention to you. And most of the time, that's not what you will experience, sadly, because it is that vanity thing, right? Who is the most successful and famous? And you will drop off the bandwagon unless you make yourself known. Wow. You got to really go in there, like confident and knowing this is your baby and it, de it deserves attention. But it's not easy. Good. Oh, that's good advice. Okay, now um, talk to me about when you get when you're getting ready to go to a fest a festival. 
you make appointments ahead of time and, and tell us how we can get the most out of a festival. The best is if you really look at the program, what's going on. And of course, writing to the director, even if the director doesn't write back at a certain point in time anymore, because they are too busy, they still see it and think, hey, cool. There's somebody who really cares about their stuff. So it will always leave a mark. And if you don't expect and get it, you never answered me. That's not a good idea, but just make yourself known. And then the power of panels, like you're here asking questions. What a beautiful, what a beautiful way of networking to sit in a room and get there early, to sit in the front, to have your presence and your charisma and your story and really listen and connect like a human, from human to human. Don't think there's the big guru. Look at the person, what's important to that person? What's important to me? What do we have in common? And then you ask an amazing question and you will see either the light switch goes on in that important person there on stage or not, right? And if it does go on, you can stay. You know, if you feel you're welcome and you've been recognized as a human, between human and human, you have an amazing connection you would have never had in another situation. And if there's appointments, set them up ahead of time. Definitely um, be proactive, study what's, um, sorry, my phone just went funny. Um, study the program, see what's up, be well informed, know how to get from A to B. Don't make it about your film only. Look at all the other stuff because there might be people screening their stuff where you think, wow, I want to know that filmmaker. I know what it feels like. Nobody's coming to my film. I'm supporting that person. And then you make friends with that person. You know, that's how you milk it. It's all about the connections and following that heartbeat. So you think we should go to uh, the classes that you offer? 100%. If you don't, I just don't understand how people cannot get the prime prime this is like the goal the truffle of a festival is these events these extra events because directors put them together to give filmmakers the direct connection that they would never get where somebody comes in as a mentor makes themselves available in person and you can just sit there in the front row and be smart and engaged well, we loved it. Carol Joyce and I uh, spoke at your last festival. That was fun for me. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah, well, you were amazing. Thank you. So, Nahid, tell us some more questions. Yes, uh, more questions. One from Susan. Um, she's asking about proof of concept. Can you expound on it and explain what you mean by it? Yes, so proof of concepts have become very fashionable these days to market your film right, when you only have the script of the feature film and you're trying to get finances. So the difference between a proof of concept, a trailer and a short film is the structure. A proof of concept is usually under 10 minutes because no executive producer really, they don't sit there for 10 minutes. The shorter, the better. They ideally only the poster and the log line, but if you have a little trailer, that gets them excited. That's all you do with the proof of concept. So you can do like between three and five minutes, tell the gist of your story, the highlights of the feature film, and just get them like, where's the rest of it? Oh my God, why did they stop there? I wanna see the whole film. That's what you wanna get from a proof of concept. So in a short film, that's much harder because you would have to stick to that structure to create something without a resolution. So it would be an open end which is quite unsatisfying for an audience to sit there, <laughs> right? But sometimes you can use a short film and make a proof of concept out of it if you have a feature film, right, that, that goes uh, hand in hand with it. So that's a proof of concept. It's slightly longer than a trailer. A trailer is actually quite expensive because you really have to show production value, production value, production value a variety of different locations and scenes to look professional and like a trailer. And a proof of concept is much easier to do. It's like a yeah. one day, two day shoot. Yeah, and it's, people love it because they understand the quality right away. Oh, skilled filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. And trust. did that. Sling Blade did a proof of concept and that's how they got the money for the feature, right? Yeah. The, several 
films have been able to do that. Uh, so now let's get into networking because this, a lot of people, if, you know, we all writers, we work behind the scenes and then we have to get out with people. And so how do we do that? There's a room full of people. Everybody's talking to each other. What do you do? Just walk I up. love this question too so much because I was so awkward with the networking because I'm from Germany. Germany is so terrible when it comes to networking. It's like, well, what can you do for me? <laughs> and the other person, I don't want to give you anything. But in America, it's so great. And especially writers who hold the treasure. You know, it's, they have, you have the story. So you can already be so, so, so proud because without story, there's nothing. And I feel that especially writers don't go often enough to film festivals. And of course, you might be an introvert, but there's always one person. If it's just a person who looks, uh, sits next to you in one of those panels, and that person gives you a smile, right? Use that smile just to make a film festival buddy. Great, amazing start. And also be confident. I feel that um, especially writers, they don't understand that they always can be, and in my opinion, have to be a producer as well. Producer doesn't mean finding the money. Not at all. Producer means taking the baby, which is the script, and being the proud, proud owner of that content, right? That means you're, you understand that any and all connections you will make at the film festival will help the baby. You don't judge, you don't care. You just listen, who is smart? Who is uh, successful? Who do I vibe with? Who is on the same wavelength? And you never know what comes of it, right? So you are everything as the writer. And please go, if you can, to film festivals, watch all the movies. You know, you can go to a director that you think, wow, if that person would direct my film. And you just say, I loved your film and I loved X, Y, Z about it. So now for networking in general, the, 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 the reverse don't do thinking is what can I get from that other person? What we do in Germany. Don't do what we do in Germany. Think, what can I do to help this other person? Because we are humans. There's always something you can do to help. If it's getting them a glass of water, if they look thirsty, I don't know, or give them a pen or listen, you know, Maybe they are looking for a charity that's based in Oklahoma, focused on X, Y, Z, and you know, ah, I know somebody, how can I help them? Once you just put your mind on how can I help them, you help yourself. It's the golden rule, you know? I couldn't give you any better advice. It has worked so beautifully for me. It completely turned the focus on me and what I want to do to where do my skills and my knowledge and my contacts fit that other person's need? And again, it transcends fame and fortune and professional accomplishments because in the end of the day, we are all humans. We are all humans, we have needs and um, I'm, I'm worthy and so are you. Right. And you are an artist, don't forget that. And, and Annabelle, the greatest thing, the greatest benefit you have are the people you know in this industry. They are the kindest and most important people. Uh, what's, what I love about it was when I first started my business, my New York office, um, a lot of people would come by at night uh, to cause, because of the traffic. And so I, we would, it was the seventies, you know, you drank your way through the day. We uh, to stop, have a drink. We played poker and uh, they uh, they became friends. We all became friends. And fast forward 10 years, that was the president of uh, Maxell, the, <laughs> the president of some of the top laboratories. All these people I could just pick up the phone and call. And and here we, I am years later in the industry. I love it. And that's my greatest asset, I think, are the people I know and the friends I have. And that's where you meet them. You meet them in places like the festival. And, uh, and it truly is, how can I help you? When you look at it that way, it's like when you give of yourself, you get back tenfold. Yeah. Right? 
I also want to add something. It came to my mind earlier. You know, especially in Hollywood, we live in a world, my goodness, the memers and the schemers, they are real. There are so many con artists in the industry and like straight up, not so cuckoo folks. And I don't want to talk bad about them, you know, because they have this great dream and the great passion, but there's a lot of lie and deceit and theft going on. So if you know that you are a good person and sincere and you stand by your word and your integrity, that can be enough, you know, to bring to the table because people are so worn out. Me too. My goodness. People, people create a two year relationship with me, held my baby, literally sat in the living room to create this friendship. And then I found out they wanted to have uh, my deposit for the house I wanted to buy. It was, it was a two year plan to get into my, my funds pretty much. And so you competing, not competing, you are in a big bucket with people who have lost their minds because they just want to have fame, fortune and are desperate to survive. So if you just can hold on to your integrity as a good person, as an honest person, as a respectful person, you add so much value to the industry right where it's all about fake it till you make it so that is that is also another important thing integrity in the film industry is a key yeah yeah key. it will get you so far because you don't have to be famous you don't have to be nothing if you are a good person anyone wants to help you so if you can set yourself apart from the from the grabby slimy mimi schemy glazed eyed folks you're a winner already already right well now i think that filmmakers should be ready to talk to distributors by the time you get to post you need to find out what kind of a contract will i be looking at talk to if you have an attorney talk to your attorney if you don't there's a book called producer to producer and maureen ryan puts in there how to take a, a contract apart well, everything that's in your contract, she tells you, you'll have a, a, a paragraph or a page about this and about this. But learn the terms, be able to talk contracts, know what you want, make a list. This is what I want when I sell my product and be prepared for people to come up and start talking to you. Now, I know you don't want to get involved with the big conversation until you have your lawyer available, but you have to have enough a knowledge to set up an appointment moving forward. You have to find out who they are, what they want, and when can we meet with my attorney? How do you, what do you think of that? 100%, I think it's great. And um, a very neat way, uh, if you are relatively new to the distributor process, if you get a meeting, take advantage of as many as possible because it's a learning experience for you. And it might be the first meeting and it might not go further, but it also might not be the last meeting because it's so great for people to know when somebody is coming back. You know, even if nothing comes of it and you behave respectfully and professionally and willing to learn and take advice. And if you can also take criticism, very important. Don't ever get defensive when somebody tells you something about your film. Just suck it up. Talk to the therapist. Argh, destroy something when you get out of there. But just take it in because there might be something that will put your career on steroids if you listen to it. So, yeah. Go to every and any meeting, see it as a learning experience, put your listening ears on instead of your blabbering mouth and find out about them, what's important to them. Because then even if your film that you have right now doesn't fill their needs, maybe the next one. And if you left a good impression, you know, and you're a good person, thumbs up. They, they love seeing a career blossom and grow. And when you come back, hey, this time I have what you were looking for. I'm so happy to see you again. Good for you. And they feel like they, they mentored you or were part of your success journey. It's great. Do everything. Yeah. Right. Very good. Connie, um, you want to look for Maureen Ryan wrote uh, Producer to Producer. She teaches at Columbia and she wrote this book because she teaches from it. 
uh, and I that's what I'm teaching. That's the next class I'm doing for writers and documentarians who want to make a film and and the only way it's going to get made truly is for them to produce it themselves. It's really hard for writers to get uh, agents, uh, to get their scripts sold. So if you love it and you want to make it, learn to produce and expand your knowledge. That's what we're doing with this class, producer to producer. So it's on the website if you're interested. I put uh, the link on the chat box for the producer class. Well, let's take some more questions, please. Okay, uh, one question that uh, came up um, is um, Prima wants to see the difference between a trailer and a teaser and a proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Trailer and teaser are very much in the same family, right? What you want is a visual wow, where you have boom, 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 boom scenes and maybe a voiceover, but they are not necessarily cheaper because if you want to have a variety, you, you know, that looks high budget and impressive and tells the story, you got to go to different locations. What I find very lame, quite honestly, is if it's a one location trailer. Don't do it. It looks cheap. It looks like you're kind of like, why didn't you do a proof of concept? Just show me the scene rather than trying to impress me with a trailer. That's not a trailer. So yeah, that's the difference. The proof of concept has the story encapsulated, like the, the best scenes of your script. Maybe I, I recommend two scenes because I'm always for opening up a room and showing me a visual variety. And then um, get me through the story, leave on a high. Leave on a high that I wanna see, ah, why does it have to stop now? I wanna know how it ends. What's wrong with these people? Give me the rest of the story. That's what you want with a proof of concept to get them on the edge of their seat and think, wow, I, I, I need to watch this film. And with the trailer, it's more kind of like, oh, wow, that's production value. Whoa, okay. But it's more commercial. This would be the difference between a commercial um, and a, yeah, just this, uh, yeah, a short film that ends on an extreme high. That's okay. the proof of concept. Uh, do you have a recommendation for making film posters that are attractive to an audience? Yes, use a professional, number one, unless you are a total pro and own your craft. You know, it's often directors have that skill and they have the Photoshop skills. It should look like the posters that are being used on the distribution platforms that where you want to land. Right. Usually the picture is incredibly crisp. It encapsulates the story and the drama or comedy, whatever it is, the colors, the palette, the fonts. There's a whole science to it to to show how well versed you are with what's current in the film market. And it starts with the font and the colors and the palettes. If you look at John Wick, for example, right, how the posters have changed, they always have a different palette. They always have a very trendy font and all of that. And you need to have that knowledge as much as possible in your poster because it shows you're ready. You're ready to be taken right there on those either streaming platforms or to the movie theaters. The more you can fit in there visually, the better. So if you know a trusted professional, let somebody else take care of it. Yeah, it's a science because it's everything in one picture, like your log line. Without your log line, you're nothing. You get lost with your story because who is your main character? What's the conflict and where, where's it gonna go? He does X, Y, Z to overcome the conflict. There's always the same methodology and people who write without a log line in place usually get lost and suddenly we are in a different genre and there's like five scenes with characters that I don't need in this film, right? And so the same rules apply. Everything needs to be in one sentence. Everything needs to be on that one poster that is important to tell me your story in a second. Yeah. Great. And then how does your festival cultivate potential distributors? So we have our own connections and we are always open to bringing more depending on who I meet, who um, 
my my uh, celebrity guests suggest um so every year i would say the approach is different we always try to mix it up and if you reach out ahead of time and ask for help hey i need distribution for this and that and it looks great and we align on the film of course i can completely go outside the festival capability as well because if you bring distributors, so usually I do workshops, that would be the prime opportunity to come. I do pitch sessions, right? That's your way to pitch your thing right there. Because if it's good, even though it says we only teach, if you have a good film and you're pitching to a distributor in a class, of course they never say no to something that they are blown away by, right? So that's how we usually do it. If you do it bigger, you will have to think about starting some sort of a market like the Cannes Film Festival does, like Sundance and all of that. I'm sure we're going to do it at a certain point in time. But you can always ask the festival people, hey, do you have ideas for distribution? And they help you as a private or like professional outside of the festival as well, if they can. Okay, uh, let's finish with the questions because we're running out of time here. Yeah. I think that people are, are looking for two minute or shorter trailers. I like for, um, for documentaries, I like a three, four minute trailer. But Karen Everett and some of the big people are saying, no, it's got to be under two minutes or I won't watch it. So somebody asked, where's a good trailer? I just interviewed Michael Torres, T-O-R-R-E-S, brilliant editor, right? So Michael, if you look him up, you'll find he's doing a wonderful film about a Puerto Rican man named Abuzu. Look at his, go online, look at his trailers, because he's a trailer editor. I highly recommend trailer editors, not someone who edits features, but who knows how to put the most important stuff in a trailer. There's a, it's a talent all of itself. So what else do we have, Nahid? Um, let me uh, take a few questions, and then we'll go to the uh, film buff questions. So... Oh, uh, Margie, thank you. Oh, how sweet. Okay. Okay, if you don't get into a film festival, <laughs> is it a good idea to ask why we weren't selected or picked? No. No, because it will actually put you off some on some sort. Um, most of the time, since it's in writing and you don't have a connection, it could come come across as defensive. And that's something we experience a lot where everybody's trying their best to make it happen for everybody. And then you have to uh, get into justification mode and you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. If you sense that your situation might be an exception where you feel a certain warmth or that it might work, if you manage to ask this in a very respectful and friendly way that it doesn't come, why didn't you select my film? Which is always the risk in writing. People don't see your eyes, right? It's like with texting without emojis. <laughs> if you find the right tone, you can try. Yeah, it's better maybe to ask um, your direct contacts. Why do you think this doesn't succeed in festivals? I think it would be more effective for you. Yeah. Because in, in, a, in a bad situation, it might cause negative attention and memorability, like, oh, there's a trouble cause. <laughs> Somebody gets mad. Yeah. So with uh, so many uh, festivals out there, how do you find festivals that suit your film subject? Is there like a website you can go to and look for this? Or? You bet there are websites, but again, I highly suggest looking on Film Freeway. Um, us as festivals, we have to put key components of our festivals in the toggle program, right? Where, for example, um, disability or women or human rights. So play around putting in the search line different, different taglines that apply to your film and see what, it com what comes up. And sometimes you gotta be inventive and describe the same thing with 20 words, <laughs> 20 different searches to have a hit. But Film Freeway is the best, best way to find fitting festivals for you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for your compliment. 
Uh, how are we doing with questions? What are you hoping for with your first kids festival, Annabelle? Oh, creating a platform for children because I do have two children that randomly, randomly, not that randomly, they are filmmakers as well. And I've never asked them to make a film. They are just part of the whole thing. Last year, they were ready present. And so it was like, you know what? I think you guys could run your own section. And for kids, and they are the CEOs of the Kids Film Festival. And I love the way they put together. I said, look, you create a logo. So I taught them how to do a logo. Um, and I had them describe the event. And I was a tough, I don't want to say bitchy, but I'm a tough boss. You know, I'm like treating them like professionals. If they want to learn about it, I'm not going to sugarcoat. And so they said, these are the awards that we want. They watch every submission coming in. And they are very different to the ethos for adults, which I love because it's way more open. When kids get creatively activated in an iPad and phone and, you know, lack of social interaction, I'm just so glad. And for them to come together, mixing and mingling with the pros, you know, they will choose those kids that have the same passion. They can come to the festival, screen in a block with professionals, create the same kind of stir and attention because kids are way less bothered with all the vanity stuff, with all the shyness. They just go right after, you know, the story they want to tell. And I think it's great for the next generation. I love, I also have very old filmmakers and I have you know, neurodiverse filmmakers and handicapped filmmakers with conquering disabilities. I have journalists, I have LGBTQ, and then I have faith-based and Christians. They all come together and all those walls between everybody, they, they disappear and they, they come together for the movie, for the cause, and they have a connection with each other afterwards. Oh so my that's God. for the film festival, having fun and bringing kids in the room. Kids are so smart. Yes, and, and someone wants to know, are you going to extend the Sunday deadline or is that locked in? The Sunday deadline? Uh, is that for the, for the submissions? I didn't even know there's a deadline coming up this Sunday. Usually we don't extend, but there will be another one because we accept until um, October we accept submissions. If okay. there's a very special need to extend that Sunday deadline, I can think about it. But <laughs> usually within Film Freeway, the, it's, it's tied to the um, whatever. The, it's like tied to the banking and to this and to that, that people usually pick the ninth as a date. Yeah. So, but if there's an important reason for somebody on this panel, I might extend the deadline or send a waiver or something. Okay, let Thank me know. So, how are we with questions? We're doing well. We have a lot of questions. I uh, can take a few more and then we'll go to the film buffs. Uh, and then I've also put um, Annabelle's contact presentation, her uh, email address in case you need to reach Annabelle. Uh, it's on the uh, presentation with her website as well as her email. So, let's take one question about. Uh, Casual pitching. What is the best way to do a casual pitching? I like that. Yes, casual pitching is very deceptive because to be a casual pitcher, you got to be the most professional pitcher of them all. And that means thousands of hours of work go into the casual, just like great acting that looks effortless, right? And if it's all real, there's so much work involved to make it look real. So, Casual pitching only works if you have your script and your story in your DNA. And without practice, it's never going to happen. You need to tell your friends. You need to tell yourself. You need to write. You need to rewrite. You need to bring it to the essence and then practice, 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 practice until it becomes natural for you. Like you're talking about making a sandwich, right? It's that, that you can retell the same thing. In, in, in natural sounding, passionate words is a lot of work. So that's my best advice. Practice, practice, practice. And have a little bit of a range between a two-liner in the elevator 
and between you know telling the whole you know like a like a one paragraph synopsis and then just know the cause know the underlying theme and get the passion because then you can talk freely if the other person wants to hear more so have that opening thing down to a science without looking i am reciting now my line that i learned no <laughs> okay very good very good okay. so carol let me let me say uh, give uh, one question to annabelle and then i'll give it back to you for the film buff question so susan is asking what needs to be in a press packet about your film Mm, everything that looks good. And even though we are humble, you know, name dropping, I know it sounds like vanity, but when it comes to business, it's eyeballs. And that's a vital piece for your project. So when it comes to press, this is when you have to go all out when it comes to bragging, but in a subtle way. So there's a way to brag without coming across as obnoxious, right? So whatever makes you look like the best and the most important and the most serious and the most everything <laughs> that goes in your press and other press, of course, the better the press, the, the better your press portfolio. So that means the outlets, if you move on from the local newspaper to, you know, maybe you spend a little bit of money on a PR person to get you a certain interview you know, you can, you can manage your press folder by getting a professional and be very wise about the expenditure. Use it as an investment. It doesn't have to be much. I believe for 200 to $500, you know, if you plan it out, you can get quite the bang for the buck with the right coverage in a magazine or an interview. Yeah. Good. That's very important. Very important. Well, you've given us a lot of great information. I sincerely thank you. So what we're going to do now, I love the film buff section. We're going to ask questions. And um, so let's start with which actor has won the most Academy Awards? So put your answer in the chat bar. I was shocked to find out because I love his work, but I didn't know that he had won three Academy Awards. And I have to say, uh, I was thrilled to see Jamie Curtis. No, it's not Robert Redford. I would have thought too, but no, no, nope. not Denzel. No uh, Googling. No Googling, yes. Think of who's one of your favorite actors. He's sort of tall. Nope. Not Tom Hanks. No, no. Uh, there you go. Yes. Margie won it. Margie. Daniel Lewis, yeah. Okay. Now, let's get into, this is a tough question, but I think it's important. Robert Bresson, a talented French filmmaker, did not call the people who worked in his film actors. He called them something else. So what was the term that he used for his actors? All no, right. It's, it's not talent. It's not well, performers. But you're on the right track. He called himself. You're on the right track, William and Robert. But while you're writing the answer, no, not participants, keep going. See, he wanted someone who had never acted before because he wanted them to just be a something on the film. And oh, there you go. Dave got it. Models. Models. That's it. Dave. He, Congratulations, uh, Dave. Right. So uh, let me just say this. Uh, there is a little book called Working Notes on the Cinematographer. And Brisson wrote that. These are just little notes he made to help him do, be a better director. And one of them is he wrote two types of film. Those who employ the resources of the theater actors, directors, etc., and use the camera in order to reproduce, right? And those that employ the resources of the cinematographer and use the camera to create. That's it. Rasson used his camera to create. So well, who uses the camera to create in today's world? I'd love to hear from you. Just Talk to me at info at from the art productions. Tell me who you think does. 
I love Orson Welles, and I love the film uh, A Touch of Evil, because he was so good at that. And he put six or seven people in one location, two room, a motel room. And he did so much with the camera. The camera controlled the whole thing, and it was five minutes for one scene. You go in at 28, you come out at 33. It's fabulous. So I'd like to know more work like that. So send me an email. We'll talk about it. But the last question today is, anybody's a winner. I just would like to know, what is your favorite Hitchcock film and why? So the first person with an answer gets the free class. The birds, strangers, rope. Real right. <laughs> well, to, why don't you, uh, Nahid, send it to the first <laughs> so they can get uh, how to fund your film. It's a three hour class. Okay. I will. Uh, Gwendolyn Black was the first one to put the birds. Okay. So, oh, hi, Prima. I'm glad you're on the call. It's nice to see all these people. Okay, Annabelle, we love what you taught us. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. We'll I'm so uh, great that you invited me. What a beautiful group of people there. Yes, we're going to take this and put it on our website and we'll put it on our channel so that they can go back and see it again. And you can take it and get a transcript made if you like, whatever. Thank you so much, sweet. Nice to see you. Take care. <laughs> Can be shape. <laughs> Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Gosh, I learned so much, Annabelle. Well done. <laughs> it's fun. Thank you. Okay.